This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. As we end today's show, remembering the human rights leader, lawyer, Randall Robinson, who's died at the age of 81 in St. Kitts, where he'd lived since 2001. Robinson was the founder of the group Trans Africa. He played a key role in the launching of the Free South Africa movement, arrested many times at the South African embassy in Washington. He also fasted, went on hunger strike, protesting against the apartheid regime and U.S. involvement with it. He was also a leading advocate for reparations for slavery. Randall Robinson also spoke out for years against U.S. policy in Haiti. In 2004, he helped expose the U.S. role in the coup that ousted Haitian President Jean-Bertrand Aristide. Randall Robinson's books included An Unbroken Agony, Haiti, From Revolution to the Kidnapping of a President, The Debt, What America Owes to Blacks, and Quitting America, The Departure of a Black Man from His Native Land. In 2013, Juan Gonzalez and I interviewed Randall Robinson in our studio. He just published his book, Makeda. When I was a child growing up in Richmond, Virginia, uh, we were called Negroes. No one I knew knew why we were called that. No one knew the provenance of that, uh, that word. It had no connection to what we might have been before we were blocked from view by that lethal, opaque space of slavery. Uh, and so, w we didn't know anything about ourselves, except we'd been called this, but not by ourselves. And it, it, it turns out that it's much like the case of the sardine. There's no such thing as a sardine, as a fish living free in the ocean. It only becomes one when it is captured and put in a can. And we were only called Negroes uh, when we were labeled during slavery as that, as, as a way of severing us from any memory of what we had been. And so we lost our, our mothers, our fathers, our families, our religions, our languages, our cultures, our memories of what we had been. And so we thought we had no history. Uh, before uh, slavery. And this name, this new name, this new label helped to facilitate that loss of memory. Now, memory is the active agent of all collective social progress. If you can't remember yourself, uh, you, you, you're suffering from serious debilitation. This novel is the story of an extraordinary a woman who is a poor, blind waitress in Richmond, uh, Virginia, who remembers past lives. And so she remembers uh, Timbuktu in the late 1300s, when her father was a priest who under, um, uh, went cataract surgery at the University of Timbuktu. Uh, she remembers her days in ancient Egypt, uh, when the two Egypts were united uh, thousands of years. Uh, before. She remembers lives in West Africa. She remembers all of this, and she, she, she uh, tells it to her grandson, who wants to be a writer. And they have a special relationship, and she swears him to secrecy that he tell no one that she has these memories, so people will think she's a bit fruity, as she says. But she remembers these lives in extraordinary detail and he is inspired by it. Now, you see, he gains his confidence from it. And this is, of course, to symbolize um, the enormous consequence. Uh, sometimes when we think of slavery, we calculate the economic consequence of it. But we have not calculated the psychosocial consequence of it unless we factor in the loss of memory, which was occasioned by a deliberate and systematic uh, program uh, imposed um, uh, from those, uh, by those who controlled us. When you were at Trans Africa and, uh, and uh, we were working in Washington, the climate in Washington in the 80s and 90s was just more incarceration, more incarceration. Did any of the, pol the political leaders that you dealt with realize the, the long-term impact of what was happening? I, I recall the 
uh, when we were first being arrested at the embassy and I went to jail at first night, um, everyone uh, in the lockup uh, with me was, uh, was black. This was you were being arrested for protesting apartheid. For protesting at the embassy. Everyone was, uh, was, was black. And I, I had some sense of this. I think at the time I was told that one out of every three uh, young black males in the District of Columbia was under one or another arm of the criminal uh, justice system. And what stunned me about it, and what continues to bother me about it, is that when we were struggling during a civil rights movement, some of us were in better positions to benefit from uh, this change that was, uh, was coming than others were. And so while we had all been in the same boat during segregation, uh, when change came, uh, we weren't all in the same boat anymore. Some of us could escape, but others of us were bottom stuck. And I, I, I don't believe that those of us who escaped uh, worked as hard, uh, as tenaciously, since, to remember those of us who could not. And, and, and the result is that we now see our future as a people in America being warehoused. Um, how can we not uh, be um, uh, concerned uh, in some relentless way about the fate of all of these young black people mm -hmm. who are being imprisoned? Mm -hmm. um, because we are indissolubly bound up with them. Mm -hmm. their, their future is our future. Our future is their future. And w we, we have to be mindful of that. But it, it doesn't so much penetrate um, if we, we don't have news of it every day. So many people don't know. Randall Robinson, talking about movements, you spearheaded the anti-apartheid movement in this country, getting arrested numerous times, among other places, in front of the South African embassy. You fasted almost unto the death to stop the uh, uh, to fight the U.S. government, President Clinton, I think, at the time, to allow Haitians to come into this country at the time of the bloody coup of um, 1991 to 1994 in Haiti. Um, talk about the power of movements and what you see uh, from your perspective now, living in St. Kitts, having quit America, in the name of one of your books, um, what you think needs to happen in this country. Just 12 percent of the people who commit nonviolent drug infractions are black. I think um, 56 percent of those, nonetheless, who are prosecuted, and something on the order of 75 percent of those who are imprisoned. I mean, we, we can see the striking unfairness of it. But we have to find a way to get that information to people. Um, outrage has to be informed by information to go anywhere. South Africa worked because everybody knew about the apartheid system when we went to jail. And so it was instant. This is a little bit more difficult. I mean, we're backward in the world in so many ways. Uh, we find ourselves um, in bed with China, uh, Iran, and two or three other nations in our embrace of the death penalty, when the rest of the world is moving in the other direction. But 75 percent of those executed are black and Hispanic. And so, the, 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 the unfairness of it is seen in the statistics of who pays and who doesn't. Um, we get sentences twice as long, as long for commission of the same crime. It's just fundamentally unfair. And the question, Amy, is how we can put this together in a way that is consumable and inspiring to people to let them know that this is not just a black um, or racial issue. It's an issue for all Americans who uh, care about democracy and equity and fair play and decency. And that's what we have to do. We're killing our own country's future, is what we're doing. Uh, and we're killing genius in jail cells mm -hmm. that uh, does not have a chance to, um, to blossom and to flower.